All right, we're moving right along in this course on to diffraction, which will build upon what we learned last week for optical interference. And so we've got a couple photos to warm us up here today, and the question I have for you is what's similar for each of these photos? You have a butterfly, a zoom-in of the wings, you've got a computer chip, and a zoom-in of the electronic uh, wiring on that chip. Well, you notice both, both of these have brilliant color, and the brilliant color comes from having very small features with periodicity, which gives us optical diffraction. So the colors for these both of these things have nothing to do with any kind of pigment in them whatsoever. Rather, if you looked at these structures, the materials that make up these structures, like metals and these scales, they have no color at all to them. And so it's by the principles of, of optical diffraction that this occurs. And when we talk about diffraction gratings, you'll understand a little bit more about how these colors are generated. So today we will mainly use wave optics to understand diffraction. The Photonics books uses Fourier optics to explain this, which is way too advanced for this course. It's very powerful, but again, it's beyond what I want to have you guys delve into. So we're going to try to use wave optics. We're going to focus on the, uh, the Huygens Fresnel principle, single and double, double slit diffraction, and then we'll talk about some holographic cards as well. Uh, this lecture has some nice animations that you can't see using the app that I use to record these lectures, but if you open the PowerPoint version and slideshow, you'll be able to see the nice animation show up because they're animated GIFs. Just a brief bit of review. We've talked about photons many times before, oscillating E field, oscillating magnetic field. You could freeze it with respect to distance and um, observe it oscillating versus time. Again, there was animated GIFs that I showed you before for these or you could uh, few, freeze time and then view it like you have here versus distance. And we said last time that if you want to track this thing, you can also just track the E-field and show the peak of the E-field as plane waves, as you see here. And that's what we'll do today, too. So we'll just track the peaks of the E-field, not, the whole, um, not the, whole, uh, the whole photon. So... We also talked about splitting a laser beam into two different beams and getting interference. And so you could start to see fringes where you have destructive interference. And that brings us to our problem today. And so let's start off not talking about um, diffraction and things like that, but let's just talk about how light propagates forward. And you'll see where this builds up into the rest of the, the, the lecture today. And so this is the, the Huygens Fresnel principle, and it, it's it's Huygens is the right way to pr pronounce it. It's not easily said. Um, it can be visualized as we have here, and this is from the Fundamental Photonics book that we reference for this course. And what they say is, I've got a wave front here. So let's say this is one wave front of light. Okay, so before I had all these, you know, I had all these different wave fronts and plane waves. Well, just pick one of these. And so this is just one wave front. And with this Huygens Fresnel. Uh, principle, each point on the wavefront generates a new spherical wavefront where the light is could go in any direction. Now, that's kind of different because if we expect a wave, we expect the waves to be moving forward, but what this is saying is that instead, each point on this can re-radiate the light in any direction. And so you see that for two of them shown here. Now bear with me, you'll see where this starts to make sense. So, it's the superposition of these individual, individual uh, um, wave, spherical wave fronts that produces another wave in another plane. So as this wave moves forward, you'll notice that when these things overlap and interfere constructively, the only place they'll do that is they can't do it out here, they can't do it out here, it won't work backwards, but where it will work is in the forward direction, where all of a sudden you can see that these things are lining up very nicely with their E-field amplitudes. And so it's the principle of interference that keeps light moving forward. And we'll, again, I'll go more into this. Here's a great definition from Wikipedia. The Huygens principle can be seen as a consequence of the isotropy, isotropy of space. All directions in space are equal, meaning that this thing could radiate any time in any direction. Any disturbance created in a region of isotropic space or medium propagates from that region in all radial directions. So if you have any kind of electromagnetic disturbance, it can propagate in any direction. The waves created by this disturbance in turn create disturbances in other regions and so on, 
but most importantly, the superposition interference of the waves results in an observed pattern of wave propagation. So this applies to everything, essentially, when you look at wave propagation in terms of why it keeps moving forward the way it does, as opposed to dissipating the energy in all directions. Think about that. You know, if you have energy, why would it not want to go in all directions to dissipate? Well, for wave energy, you can see a brilliant example why, while it, why it continues forward. So let's apply this to propagation, refraction, refraction, and reflection, and you'll start to understand this a little bit more. So let's do this one more time, and you can see how this interference effect works. Let's say I've got two photons in phase here, and I can draw it in terms of the uh, plane waves as well, because the E fields are lined up. Okay? And let's say there's two points in space. These could be two atoms, for instance, whatever you want to say, what, what they are at that point. And let's assume when the photons reach these two points, that they can re-radiate in any direction, the photon. So this photon could come here, re-radiate in any direction. This photon could come here and re-radiate in any direction. So let's see which ones work out in terms of constructive interference. So let's say the first photon comes here, and it re-radiates backwards towards this point one. So this would be where the light shows up after we do the experiment. Here's the second point, and this re-radiates backwards here. Okay? Would these be in phase when they get back to this point? Well, there's two things that you have happening here. First off, the first photon got here, re-radiated, and after it re-radiates, the second photon still had to go a distance delta 1 to get here, and then delta 2 to catch up to the starting point of this one. So you have a phase shift here, such that when the second photon gets back to this point, they will be out of phase. Now, let's look, off, look at the example of going off to the side here. Well, if the first photon comes here, let's say it could go this way. Second photon comes here, it comes this way to P2. Could, it, could they both exist at P2 in terms of the re-radiation? Well, you have a phase shift first off for this, this photon here because to get even where this one is into the vertical plane, it has to go a phase shift of 2. It'll take that long for it to get to this point. And furthermore, the, uh, the second photon, the blue one here, had to go here and then back essentially to reach this point as well. So that you have the same thing. You basically have a phase shift, so these will be out of phase. So this is prohibited as well. Well, let's look at the only case that we know is possible for the photons to keep traveling forward. So let's do P3 out here and see if it works out. So first photon comes here. It emits forward to P3. And let's see if it's, it's going to be in phase with this one here. Well, the second photon before it got to its re-radiation point here, had a phase shift of delta 2 here, okay? That means just the second path length. doesn't mean it's 2 for the path length, so I just call that the second phase shift. Notice that this photon, which was emitted first, had to go that exact same distance to catch up to here. And so the phase shifts for this to catch up to this and for this to get to the point where it was re-radiated are identical, so in forward propagation, they will be in phase. So some people refer to this as forward scattering, meaning that the light could be scattered in any direction, but it only scatters forward because of these principles. So that gives you a better idea of understanding how this principle works. And it's going to be very important for understanding diffraction, okay? This idea of every point in space allowing energy to re-radiate in any direction, okay? Because there's nothing to confine that energy. So let's, let's apply this also to refraction for Fresnel reflection, and you'll see it works out quite well for predicting those. So let's look at uh, Fresnel reflection using the Hoyen uh, Fresnel principle here. Okay, again, each point of an advancing wavefront is a source of of a new train of waves. And we had last time looked and said by interference principles, you could see that the light has to refract because the wavelength of light, spacing between the peaks and troughs, decreases in the higher refractive index media. And so for the for all the everything to stay in phase, the light has to bend because this got into this material first, this, this part of the wave got into the material first, it has to slow down and bend such that when the rest of the plane wave comes up here, it all stays in phase once it makes it into the material. We'll look at it using the uh, Hoyan Fresnel principle as well. Here comes my plane wave coming in, there's my E-field amplitudes. Consider each point here being a new radiator in any direction of the radiation. And what you'll notice is if you do this and you take into consideration that your spacing between your, um, 
your peaks and your valleys decreases a little bit, and you do overlap of all these new potential waves, you'll see that the only place they overlap ends up being where these lines exist here. Okay, and you can see that most beautifully right here where all of these are overlapping right here and then you can see your interference predicts that it will also go in this direction giving you refraction. And so if the refractive index changed to an even higher level of, of, um, of refractive index then you know the spacing in between here would become smaller and so this would actually shift in a little bit for these waves and then you find that your refraction would be something like this and they would refract even more. Okay, and so you can see how this principle also predicts Snell's law of refraction quite nicely as well. Let's look at Fresnel reflection. Uh, if it's called the, if it's called the Huygens Fresnel uh, principle, then maybe it should predict Fresnel reflection. So, if you really want to understand Fresnel reflection, it requires quantum electromagnetic uh, understanding beyond the focus of this course. You need to go pretty deep into this stuff. And you can solve all optics this way, but it's a lot more difficult. But let's try to, to understand this a little bit here and see if we can make sense of it in a way that you understand for now reflection at a deeper level too. So remember, as light enters a piece of glass from air to glass, the electric field will oscillate the valence electrons around the atoms. Okay, And so if I have an atom, there's the nucleus, and I've got these electrons orbiting around it, if I apply an E-field to this, then the orbit could shift, right? It could shift the orbit of these electrons. And so it can respond to the E-field. Now, I know it's elastic for an atom, right? It's an elastic. It's kind of like a spring. So if I'm moving charge, remember, when you move charge quickly on an atomic level, you have the basis to create a new photon, right? That's how we looked at how photons were generated in things like... Um, uh, atomic spectra from uh, plasmas and uh, atomic gases and in semiconductors. And so these oscillations act as a new dipole radiator which emits light in all directions, just like that was predicted on the previous slides with the Hoyhen Fresnel principle. So we showed on the previous slide that the light just keeps going forward, even that even though that's the case if you're interacting with air molecules or atoms that the light will keep going forward because of this forward scattering concept. However, if the density of atoms is different in the glass versus just outside the glass, then that perfect case we had in the previous slide is actually disturbed. Okay, So if you do the math and you look at the overlap of waves trying to go forward, you'll find that right here at the interface, this symmetry of this forward scattering is broken up and actually some of it is actually reflected backwards and that's what causes Fresnel reflection. And this makes perfect sense because think of a metal. In a metal, you have tons of electrons that can move freely in the electric field. And so as a result, this dipole effect is much stronger. You see a much bigger discontinuity in the ability of the light to be re-radiated in, in the gas versus the metal. And so your metals will reflect up to 95%. But also, in a metal, the moving electrons are free, right? They're not bound to the atoms. The metal has free electrons. And so you actually will generate for a metal some current as the metal, as the electrons move forward, back and forth. Again, if you move electrons in a conductor that has some resistance, then you're going to have ohmic heating or ohmic loss. And so that's why a metal actually absorbs some of the light as well, where with Fresnel reflection, it may be weak, but there's no absorption of the, um, of the light whatsoever because the interaction with the atoms in that is completely elastic. You're just basically treating the atom like a spring where you're perturbing the orbit of the electrons, but you're not actually moving them through a conductor where you have ohmic loss. So this is nice because it also, Fresnel, Huygens Fresnel principle, also uh, now predicts uh, Fresnel reflection and reflection from metals as well. So let's do a quick review. The Huygens Fresnel principle predicts forward propagation based on interference principles. If you do the same thing and you look at these as re-radiators at an interface here, it also predicts refraction and Snell's law. And now we've explained how Hoyhen fresnel interference predicts reflection
from a glass air surface or at a metal surface as well. So let me ask you this question then. This, now we're ready to start looking at uh, diffraction. What do you think happens when light is incident on a single slit or a pinhole? So if all of a sudden I have light coming up to something which is really narrow and I've got all these plane waves coming in and I could have a re-radiator right there, what do you think could happen on the other side out here? Would it keep moving forward like this or would I all of a sudden break up this system because I no longer have multiple radiators to build on top of each other because they're blocked. They're being blocked by this slit so I only have one radiator here. And so does it have to go forward straight or could it go in all directions? Because it's really unbound at this point. So let's look at that. Here is a single slit that is about as wide as the wavelength of light incident on. That's very important. It's only about as wide as the wavelength of light incident on. And what happens is you could treat this then at that point as a single tiny little re-radiator here. And because there's nothing else for it to interfere with out here, because you're blocking with this, this yellow is the, the, the blocking material of the slit, because you're blocking the rest of these re-radiators, there's no interference, so it can propagate in all directions. So as the light comes through, different photons propagate in all directions, as you can see here. Okay? So, this is going to be different than what we had before. If we remove the slit in the same plane, each point acts as a new spherical wave front. But like in the image above, they're all constructively interfered to support forward propagation as a plane wave. So if we remove the slit and we get back to the point where we've got multiple re-radiators going in all directions here, and you look at the interference, it would add back up to plane waves, just like we had over here. Okay. So let's not get rid of the slit entirely, but let's see what happens if we basically change this system where we increase the width of the slit a little bit such that we can allow maybe a couple of these re-radiators to exist, and we'll see what we get. But at this point, I'm going to pause. We'll cover that in the next part for this lecture. So do a little bit of review here, take a break, and then let's see what happens when we widen that slit up a little bit.